and welcome to the Ben Swan Radio Show. It is Wednesday today, or is it Thursday? Thursday. It's Thursday. Oh, Thursday. it is Thursday. Thank goodness. For a minute there, I thought that we were only at hump day, but we're we're actually only a day away from we're the day the hump, from the weekend. <laughs> we're over the hump, my friend. We are. How you doing, Zach Bohannon? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm well. I'm excited about uh, this particular uh, situation that we have uh, today because we have a terrific guest with us. Someone yeah. I've been talking about for quite some time on this show. Very interesting. Yeah, Shauna ba- Banda. Shauna Banda, uh, who is the young woman who actually used the Rick Simpson formula for cannabis oil and extracting CBD on cookie sheets with a spatula in her home treated her own, I believe it was Crohn's disease. Fascinating. It is. Incredible. It absolutely is. So we're excited to have her on the show. We're going to talk to her about uh, a whole bunch of issues, including um, the rights of people to be able to seek treatment uh, for disease and for illness, um, and the fact that government really stands in the way of that for almost unexplicable reasons. I, I say unexplicable because if you if you're naive about government and you're naive in thinking that government's main objective is to protect people uh, and to care for people and to help people pursue a better life, if you're naive enough to think that, uh, then it would be inexplicable. Uh, if you realize that most government is just made up of people. Uh, who essentially are looking out for themselves and their friends um, and really want to control behavior, and they do it in the name of kindness, goodness, charity, graciousness, <clears throat> gentleness, and self-control. Yes. <laughs> All those good All the things. the fruit of the Spirit. Right? They're just good people, and I just want to do good things for you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to talk to her today. That will be coming up uh, at the half-hour mark at the bottom of the hour. Uh, but I want to tell you about this story that's up at BenSwan.com. We'll start off with this today uh, because it's the kind of thing that makes your head explode. Democratic Congressman Joe Garcia, hello, Joe, says, quote, We have proved communism works. We've proved communism works. Isn't it correct to say we have proven? proven. Uh, that was my first thought. Thank that you. communism Thank works. You. Oh, Joe. <laughs> There's going to be a whole lot of oh, Joes in this. Oh, Joe. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I, I, Joshua Cook from Menswan.com writes this article. He starts off with, of course, the guy who was caught on camera eating his own earwax thinks that communism works. There's a link to that, by Josh. the way. Josh. <laughs> Josh, is that really necessary for this story? There is a link, and I know you went and watched it, didn't you? <laughs> I want to click on it. I, I did click on it earlier, <laughs> and uh, I, I just I had to see I it. Can't. <laughs> Actually, um, what's funny about it? If you watch the video, and again, this is a this is an aside. <laughs> However. He's kind of feasting on that earwax. It's not just like <laughs> he takes it out and puts it in his mouth. I mean, he's like going to town on his oh. fingers uh, in the background. He's in the background of a of a shot on C-SPAN, and, oh, and he's Joe. Joe, you're on. You're on camera. He's eating like he's at a picnic. <laughs> Dude, he's hungry. It's the meetings go long. He's starving. He hasn't had anything to eat. I'll lay off me. I'm starving. Oh, I, I think I found some uh, some lint under this fingernail. I'll eat that too. Oh heaven! So uh, that aside, the 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 piggishness of him, uh, eating his own earwax on C-SPAN. Forget about that for a minute because that has nothing to do with the bigger story. Joshua Cook, shame on you. Uh, Florida Congressman Joe Garcia is at it, at it again. Last week he was caught on camera having <laughs> having an earwax snack. <laughs> this week he sung the praises of communism. Which one is worse? Dun, dun, yeah, well, yeah, that is a toss-up. <laughs> Communism's I great. The latter or earwax. <laughs> Both of them are delicious. Delicious. In a Google Hangout on immigration, he said, quote, let me give you an example. The kind of money we've poured in, he said. So the most dangerous, sorry, the most safest city in America is El Paso, Texas. That's my hometown. That's your hometown. It happens to be across the border from the most dangerous city in the Americas, which is Juarez. Right? I love the fact that he asked right? a question that, afterwards. Check me. Right? Check me. Um, I will be in a minute, <laughs> Joe, so hold, hold your horses there. He goes on to say, uh, and two of the safest cities in America, two of them, are on the border with Mexico, Garcia continued. And, of course, the reason is that we've proved that communism works. What? If you give everybody a good government job, there's no crime. 
What? I'm not following the logic here. But that isn't what we should be doing on the border. He continued. What? Wait a minute. Didn't you just say that <laughs> if we give everyone a good government job, there's no crime followed by, but that isn't what we should be doing on the border? Well, why not? I thought you just said there's no... If that actually led to no crime... Then why wouldn't... <laughs> that's not a bad plan. Not bad. But that isn't what we should be doing on the border, he continued. The kind of money we've poured into it and we're having diminishing returns. Hmm? Okay, well... <sighs> Joe. Joe. Let's start here, my friend, um, from Florida. Which is nowhere near El Paso, Texas. It's only about, I don't know, the state of Florida, something like 1,600 miles away. Uh, I mean, if he's a, for crying out loud, if he's a congressman in Houston, he'd still be like 800 miles yeah. away from That's, El Paso. Yeah. All right, so nowhere near that area. But but I want to talk about this, and, and I know we're going to get, get close to a break here, so on the other side of the break I want to get more into this. But um, this is a, an issue that is actually an important one because there's a lot of misnomers here. And he, he, he refers to El Paso being the safest city in America. Um, El Paso has been on the lists for considered the safest city. It's based on a couple of things. It's based on, um, and by the way, it's safest for the city of its size, so it's considered a medium to small city. Um, because El Paso is actually the 21st largest city in the country. A lot of people don't realize that. But it has virtually no cities around it and, and virtually no suburban areas around it. So, you know, you go to a place like Houston that's just sprawling or Dallas that's sprawling. Um, and those cities are, are much, much larger, uh, even though the actual city itself, you know, the, the, the corporation there of the city is probably not much larger. You have so many towns and so many areas around it and so many people there. Um, so just in terms of DMA, which is what TV stations use, just to give you an idea, El Paso is the 21st largest city in the country, but it's the 99th largest TV market because it only broadcasts to El Paso and then a little small section of southern New Mexico. Okay? Um, and, and the reason that's significant is because, for instance, like a, a Cincinnati, for instance, as a TV market, is somewhere around 35, 36. Well, Cincinnati as a city itself is actually a smaller city than El Paso, but because there's so many people around the area, uh, northern Kentucky and uh, in Indiana, and then north of the city, east of the city of Cincinnati, there's a far larger population for the area. Okay, So the only reason I bring that up is because when, when El Paso gets its rating as safest city, it's among similar-sized cities. So it's being compared to um, other medium to smaller cities, number one. So uh, that's important, important to make that distinction. Number two, why would El Paso be the safest city of its size in the country number one and number two, respectively, on the list, depending on the year, versus a city like Juarez across the river, which has three million people in it at one point and is the most dangerous city in the Americas. How is that even possible? That's actually Those two statistics are technically true. But I want you to think about it for a minute. We're coming up on a break here. I want you to think about it. When we come back from that break, I want to talk to you about why that is and some of the misnomers there, as well as issues of what, what this has to do with communism and the fact that it proves absolutely nothing when it comes to communism. Proves absolutely nothing. Sponsor as we get started today is SnoopWall.com. I want to encourage you to check out BenSwan.SnoopWall.com. If you go there, uh, you can actually save 20 to 50% off. For folks who are on your smartphone using your apps to be able to watch you through video and access your microphone, SnoopWall is your port authority. BenSwan.SnoopWall.com. Check them out. We're back after the break. And welcome back to the show. Okay, before the break, I was telling you here on the Ben Swan Radio Show about this... Uh, the story about Joe Garcia, the congressman from Florida, saying that uh, communism has been proven to work. Use the example of uh, my hometown, 
where I not only where I grew up, but uh, where I started my journalism career. Talked about El Paso and talks about Juarez, uh, the city across the river, engaged in a violent and deadly drug war, one that I covered for three years, literally inside of Mexico. Um, not to say anything with a, a big head, but there are very few people in the country who have as much experience on this particular issue as I do. Very few. Uh, and and the ones who do, I, I can name them for you um, because they're friends of mine uh, and have covered this. So here's the deal. Uh, one of the misnomers when, when Joe Garcia says that El Paso is the safest city in the country, but Juarez is not, and he, he's pretending that money poured in uh, by the federal government, I'm assuming this is the case he's making, poured in by the federal government into that city has made it safer because it's a redistribution of wealth. By redistributing people's wealth into this particular community and putting that money in to help people, that it becomes a safe city. And on, in, on the Mexican side, where that's not happening, it's a dangerous city. Now, if that's the argument um, that Joe is making, that is the most asinine thing I've ever heard. Because, number one, the violence in Juarez is not the result of a lack of government funding. It's actually the opposite. Here's a little truth for you. The reason that Juarez is in the situation that it's been in is because drug cartels were killing each other in that city. And because one particular cartel, the Sinaloa cartel, was being funded by and supported by the Mexican government and the Mexican military. And it was that support, financially and through firepower and military power, that the city became so chaotic. Up until Felipe Calderon became president of Mexico and began his war on drug cartels, uh, you didn't have the kind of violence that you had in the last few years. So that was the first thing. So, so you could argue that government intervention and involvement actually encouraged it but let's go let's go beyond that so how can el paso be such a safe city and Juarez be such a dangerous city i will tell you for a fact and with first-hand knowledge that one of the re reasons for that is because el paso lies about its crime numbers i'll give you two examples Example number one, there was a guy when I was down there as, a, as an anchor and reporter uh, covering this stuff. There was a guy who lived in an area called Horizon City, which is, you know, in the far east side of El Paso. And in Horizon City, this guy, uh, he's out there and uh, one day around two o'clock in the afternoon, some guys show up at his house, go inside with guns, literally pull him out of the house, drag him to a car, throw him inside the car and drive away. Neighbors see it happening. They call the police. News stations get calls about it. This guy was taken in broad daylight out of his house and he was, he was taken. So he becomes a missing person. About three weeks later, this guy is found, not in El Paso. He's found dead in Juarez, naked on a street. His middle fingers have both been cut off and shoved down his throat. He was killed as part of a drug killing. All right? Because the guy's body was not found in El Paso, it is not considered an El Paso homicide. It does not change their homicide rate. Now, I want you to think about something else here. Because this was happening on a regular basis. People were either getting kidnapped out of El Paso and taken into Juarez and killed, or what, what cartels would do or Hitman would do or these organized crime groups would do is they'd wait till somebody crossed the bridge. And when you cross the bridge, they go get you on the bridge. Why? Because if you were, you know, kill someone in El Paso, yes, there is police, sheriff's departments, detectives who start looking into the case. If you kill someone in Juarez, there's nobody looking for you. Why is that? It's very simple. Because when you have cops who work for cartels killing other cops who work for cartels and military killing cops who work for cartels and cops killing military who works for cartels and you have this, this bloodbath, this constant chaos, there is no order or law enforcement whatsoever in the city. Which means it becomes like a playground over there. You can kill anybody. No one's ever going to find you. 
No one's even looking for you. It was so bad in Juarez that the coroner would take, simply take the bodies out in mass and they were dumping them in mass graves because there was no one to claim the bodies. There was no one to identify the bodies. They didn't have enough room in the morgue to keep the bodies in Juarez. That's how bad it was. So there is a misnomer if you think that people in El Paso had nothing to do with what was going on in Juarez, number one. Number two, uh, there were violent crimes that were committed that were never reported as such. Another example. So um, there was a restaurant on the east side of town uh, that one night burns to the ground. It had just been built, brand new restaurant. It was owned by a guy who was connected to Narcos. And uh, it burns to the ground. Massive, raging inferno. So the original story was, oh, um, it, it was an electrical fire. They didn't have things wired up properly, and that's why it burned down. Two other restaurants at a similar time burned down nearby. Okay? And the official story was it was an electrical fire. It doesn't go into crime statistics. But the guys I knew, the sources I had inside the fire department there, said absolute lie. Not true. Not true. That, that someone had gone in and actually wired explosives into the rooftops of those buildings, had wired the fuse boxes, and they burned them down because the guy was involved with another cartel. So they burned down the restaurants. Well, in any other city, those are acts of arson. But if it's an electrical fire, it doesn't go down that way. So there is a lot of misreporting of crime that goes on in those border cities. And if I'm going to kill someone in El Paso, if I'm going to take out a, a, a competitor, a rival cartel guy, a rival drug dealer, someone who I think is, is competition for me on any level, I'm not going to kill them in El Paso. I'm going to drag them across the border, and I'm going to kill them in Mexico. And that's what happens over there. So when, when, when Joe Garcia says that two of the safest cities happen to be border cities, well, that makes total sense. If you're going to kill someone, you take them across the border. You don't kill them there. You can't do that if you're in Memphis. You can't do that if you're in, in Alabama someplace. But you can do it if you're in El Paso. So um, the misnomer of the city being safer because government's putting money into it is it's just flatly flatly untrue um and even then his argument doesn't make sense because he says and we're getting diminishing returns listen el paso for all the money that's poured into it by government the, the top jobs in el paso are probably government jobs that's true the problem is there's no middle class there it has an incredibly low standard of living the average income is incredibly low uh, people there struggle. There's no garment manufacturing anymore. NAFTA killed that. Uh, there's no blue collar jobs. There is, you work for Border Patrol, ICE, DEA, DHS, and you have a good job with a good pension. And if you don't work for a government agency, then you don't. And, and you know what? Maybe that is proving not that communism works, but that a government system essentially says you work for us and you're taken care of. And if you don't, you're on your own. Because that's what El Paso is. If you don't work in some kind of government agency, and that's not bashing anyone who does, but if you don't work in a government agency, you don't make a good living there. There are very, very, very few people who do. It's a city built completely on cronyism. It's built completely on graph. Um, and the fact is people who live there want to get out of there, the vast majority of them. So this is a, a very poor example if we want to talk about how communism works. Uh, because it doesn't work at all. If communism worked, everyone there should be living a great life and making tons of money, and they're not. Uh, they struggle to make ends meet, and most of the city, or vast majorities of the people, are on government assistance, which means just enough to get by. All right, we'll have much more, including our guest, Shauna Banda, when we come back. And welcome back to the Ben Vaughn Radio Show here on RBN, the Republic Broadcasting Network. Glad that you're with us, and I'm really glad that you are going to be sticking around because our next guest is somebody who uh, will inspire you and uh, hopefully give you some great insight into a lot of the truth surrounding uh, medical marijuana and CBD oil and kind of her experience, her journey here. Uh, it's been an inspiration for an awful lot of people. Shauna Banda, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I, I'm so excited to talk to you because uh, your story is one that, that we've highlighted quite a bit. Um, Evan Mulchai, who I think you spoke with, um, actually wrote an article about you for BenSwan.com. And, uh, I mean, your story is pretty incredible. This goes back to, what, 2002, is that right? 
Yeah, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2002. And, and for folks who don't really understand Crohn's disease, what exactly is that? Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease, and um, it can affect anything from, it affects the entire digestive tract, so it affects anything from the mouth to the anus. And pretty much what it is, is it feels like you have a constant stomach flu that won't go away. So you're constantly nauseous, your stomach is constantly cramping, you know, you have those horrible, painful stomach cramps when you've got the stomach flu or uh, even food poisoning is comparable. Um, and it just doesn't go away. So I had to live like that for seven and a half years. I literally raised my kids from the couch and tried every pharmaceutical option that was offered, uh, including many, many surgeries. So um, when I when I watched Rick Simpson's movie Run from the Cure online, I knew that I knew for sure I wanted to try it. Um, I actually didn't even smoke cannabis until I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and my husband was pulling my hair back as I was puking in the toilet and begging me to try it. He said, you know, you have the same symptoms as cancer patients. Just please try. And just smoking it made me fall to the floor and cry because it's like finding out Santa Claus isn't real as an adult. Your whole world changes. And um, because it helped me better than any pharmaceutical I'd ever had, just smoking it. So so just to be clear, so you've been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Um, your Crohn's yeah. disease uh, was considered terminal because your condition was so progressively worse. Is that correct? Yeah, it was progressively worse. And then they, um, I had had so many surgeries on top of that. And, you know, towards the end of my disease, I had blown my lungs twice in a month. And I also had this huge uh, cystic growth on my face. The roof of my mouth was turning black. I had this black cloud covering the roof of my mouth. My teeth were all mushy. Uh, I wrote about it in the book, and I didn't realize until after uh, I wrote the book and went to see a doctor in uh, Boulder, and he told me, he goes, Shauna, that was necrosis. You were rotting from the inside out. You were days, if not hours, away from death. People just don't survive that kind of infection. But I did. Well, that's incredible. So, okay, so so you you started smoking uh, marijuana, and you, and you said that had an effect on you. It had a, a positive effect. Yeah, it absolutely had a positive effect. It helped my nausea and my pain so much um, that I used it throughout my throughout my sickness. And um, I want to say I was smoking in two thousand and three or two thousand and four, and. Um, and it wasn't until, I want to say, 2007, uh, late 2007, that I watched uh, Run From The Cure on YouTube and uh, just kind of notched that away in my brain, thinking if smoking helps me this much, I wonder what this oil could do for me. Okay, so let's talk and, about uh, the Run For The Cure. To, to, for people who don't know what that is or have never seen it, what exactly is Run For The Cure by Rick Simpson? Run From The Cure is just a... It's a very rough documentary of a man in Canada named Rick Simpson who uh, had remember hearing that marijuana cured cancer back in the 70s. And when he got skin cancer, he went up to his doctor and said, what do you think if I made an oil out of this? And his doctor was like, well, try it, you know. And he was able to get rid of his skin cancer, I want to say within like two weeks. And he started making it and giving it out to people who had cancer or disease. And it got to a point where he was he was challenging people. Let's find out what this won't help because it's helping everything. And um, and then he got online and <clears throat> they did that documentary and put out there exactly how to make it. Now the only problem is for me was when I was watching it, you needed to have an entire pound of cannabis in order to make the two ounces that he said that you needed to cure yourself. And I you're, you're just extracting the oil from it. Yeah, you're just extracting the oil from it. But you need a whole pound of it to get that two ounces. And I'm in Kansas going, gosh, I can't, I can't hardly get the ounce that I need a week. Just, <laughs> right. just a pound survive. of marijuana. That's a lot of marijuana. 
Yeah, yeah, and there was no way I could find a whole pound of it when sitting here in Kansas. So um, I just kind of knocked it in my memory and went on about my business. And um, my I had a spontaneous pneumothorax, which means I had a blister on my lungs that um, I believe was caused from the Remicade that I was on. Um, it caused the tissue in my lung to weaken, causing a blister. And I sneezed in the shower, and the darn thing popped. And so I had a collapsed lung. <laughs> I had a collapsed lung, and um, I got out. I think I spent two weeks in the hospital. That time I got out was out a week, and it collapsed again, and I was in ICU for a few weeks. Uh, the, the, so sneeze, when I got out, the sneeze in the shower... Because of the blister on your lung, caused your lung to collapse. Yes, the blister would the blister then popped and then made my lung collapse. Wow! And so uh, by the second time it collapsed, uh, in order to fix it, he uh, my surgeon put uh, a fine talc between my lung and my rib cage, so it would create a thicker wall of scar tissue, so it wouldn't happen again. But. Um, when I got home, my husband was like, you know, at that point, I was smoking like nine joints a day just to try to survive and function and, and be some kind of a mom to my kids. And, uh, and. Nine he, joints a day? Can't, Are were yeah. you, so did, were you becoming incapacitated through that? I mean, were you just, how you high know, were actually, you all the time? I found different ways to, uh, I, I love being functional. I like to be pain-free and functional. So um, doing my own research and finding out different things, I found a reishi mushroom um, that helps take the any kind of cloudiness away from your brain and allows you to be functional, allowing you to keep the body high that you have. So I drank Gano coffee, which has the reishi mushroom infused in with it to um, help allow me to function throughout the day and and not have this tight grip around my intestines 24-7. So, but by the time my lungs collapsed, my husband told me, you can't be smoking joints like that anymore, so we need to get you a vaporizer. So I'm all excited, you know, these you got these cool volcanoes and, you know, all this stuff. I'm thinking I'm going to get this really fancy machine, and uh, and I get this old-fashioned glass dome vaporizer from the 70s that was <laughs> obviously the cheapest thing he could find online. <laughs> right. <laughs> he went to some so, pawn shop someplace and said... Yeah, and so I was so upset with him. I was, I really was. I was so upset with him. And, uh, and I tried smoking it through the vaporizer. It didn't work for my pain, so I put it away for a few months. And then the town went dry, and there was nothing that I could find. And, in fact, I found... Um, I did find some uh, Mexican brick here in town, and it was very, very seedy. And upon smoking it, it made me puke uh, mm. because the seed content was too strong. And so I thought, well, I'll pull. I was just desperate at this point. I pulled out that vaporizer, and not really wanting to take a hit off of it, I just got lost in a book and pinched off that hose too long. <clears throat> and um, my husband walked in and. And he looked at the dome, and he was like, wow, I wonder if that's the same stuff Rick Simpson makes. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So we're, we're coming up on a break, so let me have you hold on for a second. But just to be clear, so so you had this, this um, basically Mexican brick with you, too many seeds, made you sick, so you put it in the vaporizer, and by pinching off the hose, it started turning to oil? Yes. Sitting inside the vaporizer from the seventies. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely and, and incredible. It was beautiful red droplets of oil just gathering all over this dome. It was great. Wow! So this this was actually something you stumbled upon by accident. Okay, Shauna Vanda, don't go anywhere. Uh, I want to hear more about the next step in your process. You have found a way uh, to create CBD oil. Uh, which is stunning in and of itself. We want to hear about what happened next on the other side of this break. Don't go away.
And welcome back to the Ben Swan Radio Show. This segment brought to you by AnthemVault.com. If you go to AnthemVault.com, you can uh, purchase gold and silver there through a great system that we consider to be the future of gold. All you have to do is sign up for your free account. You'll receive free gold and silver when you do. But it's all about liquid gold with these guys. And liquid gold meaning liquidity in the system. You can buy it. You can sell it. You can you can move it all around. It's fantastic. Uh, it's such an easy system. This is not your daddy's gold and silver system. Check them out. AnthemVault.com. Use the promo code BIN and you get uh, entered into a contest for $500 in free gold and silver again at anthemvault.com our guest at this hour is Shauna Banda who's telling us an absolutely incredible story uh, before the break explained the fact that she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and suffered just unimaginably from it for years uh, and finally got to the point where she began smoking marijuana had some basically not very good quality, very seedy marijuana that she ended up with, uh, put it into a vaporizer, pinched off <laughs> the tube, and it wound up turning into cannabis oil. Is that is that more or less the long and short of it, Shauna? It really is. And as soon as we found out there was oil inside that dome, my husband went out and got us a spatula, and, um, and I was able to scrape that oil out. And it was just a very minute amount like the size of maybe the quarter size of a pencil eraser. It's a very, very small amount. and A um, quarter size of a pencil eraser? Yeah. So you basically had a drop. Yeah. It, just a drop. Yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, I took that three times a day, and in three days I didn't need my cane anymore um, to walk. I could walk on my own. Um which is wonderful. A lot of people think it was just, you know, I was able to throw my cane to the side and, and be okay. It's not really like that. Uh, I was just, I was a fighter. So as soon as I didn't need my cane, man, I was so proud to not have it. And I knew I was healing and I knew I needed to stay on that road. So I didn't stop. I didn't look back. Uh, I started writing a journal because the results were just so profound. Nerve damage was going away. Scar tissue was ripping away from uh, the inside of my abdomen, allowing me to stand up straight. Um, it it was a long, arduous process, but every every step that I every step that I took was a step better, you know. And um, and I literally went from feeling the degradation of dying, the pain from dying, uh, knowing that I wasn't going to be here very long, to literally waking up on day three knowing that I was going to live long enough to see my grandkids someday. And, um, and I just had to write it all down in a journal because I didn't think anyone was going to believe me. No one was coming out about this at the time. And there was hardly any kind of information. So I wrote my book and went out to Colorado to get it published and to, uh, you know, do what I could. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that, and that book um, is, that journal became a book called Live Free or Die, correct? Yes. So are you in Colorado now? Is that where you live now? No, I was in Colorado for about three years. And um, I ended up getting separated from my husband and, and couldn't make it down there financially. It was really tough trying to just move your family up to a different state and try to just make it uh, make it there when everyone else was trying to make it there in the same exact field. <laughs> yes. So uh, we just we couldn't do it. And I, um, I ended up coming back home. I'm in Kansas now. And um, but nothing has changed. I'm. I'm consulting people who come to me and need it. And, uh, you know, as long as they can, you know, provide their own medicine, man, I'll help you out, you know, walking you through the process of the machine and, and, uh, help you out as much as I can, you know, to get you on your, your own road. So, so do you still, has, do you still take cannabis oil? Every day. Every day. How, how I, much do you take? I take, uh, it depends. So uh, right now I'm on a maintenance dose of once a day, but if I decided to go out and uh, I can drink now, 
So if I go out and have a couple of glasses of wine with my friends, I'll take, you know, I'll take three the next day to make sure nothing gets agitated or irritated or inflamed in any way. And the same goes for if I get sick, if I get, uh, I still have kids in school, so I still get the flu and a cold every once in a while. Um, and then I'll take extra oil to help me get over that. But it's nice to be able to self-regulate exactly what I need and when I need it with a plant. It's wonderful. With a plant, a, nat a naturally occurring plant from which you're just yeah. extracting the oil. Yeah. And yeah, and I went out to Colorado. I tried. I have made over 100 ounces of Rick Simpson oil with a solvent thinking that, um, you know, that was going to work so much better and that what I had was just crap. <laughs> and I wanted something, I wanted the best of the best. But what I found out was um, the Rick Simpson oil that you make with a solvent um, decarboxylates at its different temperature. And only certain cannabinoids are activated in that way, and you have a much higher uh, ratio of THC in the Rick Simpson oil. So mm -hmm. what I found was a lot of people that I was working with in Colorado, it would take them three to four weeks of absolute, I mean, they were just so high and couldn't function and slept for three to four weeks before they were starting to get a tolerance and actually feel better. And it didn't make sense to me because it only took me a few days. And then I realized, well, maybe what I stumbled upon is completely different. And then... um and then we, you know, started t sending as what I could into labs, and that's when they were telling me, "Oh, this is this is really high in CBD and CBN and CBGs and all this stuff," and we're interested in the high THC. So I kind of I was blown off so many times. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but that's kind of Colorado. shifted now, right? The, the 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 whole shift has now taken place where CBD is the hot thing, and everybody wants CBD oil as opposed to the THC. Yeah, isn't that amazing? But the, here's the thing is they've gone to the complete other spectrum and yes. they want CBD only, and only, which is not, yeah, it's, that is not feasible. You have to have a complete full spectrum of cannabinoids in order for this stuff to work. I know that there are CBD oils out there that many people are getting benefit from. It's cutting seizures in half. It's doing all that stuff. But if you have, uh, it's, you can make it in your own house with this little machine. You have a high CBD oil that has a broad spectrum with a small amount of THC, CBD, CBNs, all this stuff. It stops your seizures completely. It doesn't just cut them in half. People don't understand that um, you shouldn't be afraid of this. Our grass root has developed so much over the years that science came up behind us and tried to prove us wrong. And then we found out that, you know, we've all been taught for generations that our skin, the endocrine system, is the largest system of our body. But that's not the case anymore. Science found out that the endocannabinoid system is the largest system of your body. And you have CB1 and CB2 receptors that reside in every single system of your body, which when these receptors are activated, they can create homeostasis within each System, which means it brings balance. Your body can communicate with itself to heal itself within itself. <laughs> it's it's incredible. It's and the, and the science, as you said, we're, we're just beginning to kind of tap into this. And as you said, I mean, this is something that is actually old science uh, becoming yes. becoming new again. This is not something that someone just figured out. It's something that people actually knew for a long time. It's been suppressed for a long time, and now it's coming back out again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's been suppressed. I mean, if you think about it, it's been suppressed forever. Um, when Christianity even came into play, think about how all of the pagan uh, women who were burned at the stake for being witches because they knew about plant medicine. Um, right. Uh, we're coming up on a, a, another break here. Yeah, let me, can you stay over the, the break here? Yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to have more with you when we come back. But, but Sean, I want to talk to you specifically about some of the people you're working with because uh, this has applications beyond Crohn's disease.
And I want to talk to you about that and, and steps that people as individuals can take without now being subjected to kind of the new grassroots Big Pharma. We'll talk about that when we come back. It is hour two of the Ben Swan Radio Show here on RBN, the Republic Broadcasting Network, and uh, thrilled to have as our guest uh, this hour, Shauna Banda, uh, telling us just a remarkable story of her own healing from Crohn's disease that took place uh, as she began to to discover and utilize uh, CBD oil, THC oil, and and really the combination. And I agree with what you were saying, Shauna. I think we have to be careful. Uh, when we refer too often uh, to CBD because it comes off as if we're essentially saying this one particular cannabinoid is the one that has value and everything else is, is useless because that's simply not true. That is true. That is true. It's just like uh, taking, it's like what the pharmaceutical companies did with Marinol is they made a synthetic uh, THC and it's THC only that doesn't work for so many people, and it and it the cost of it is absolutely ridiculous. That's exactly what they're doing with this uh, CBD only oil. Is they're trying to glamorize it and make it sound like it's safe and um, and the best way to go when in fact it's it's absolutely not. Well, I, to me, not. it appears that they're, what they're creating is a there is uh, there's marijuana, and then inside cannabis you have two and there are actually dozens but they they the way that you would hear it from media is there are two forms of cannabinoids there's the cbd that's the good cannabinoid there's thc that's the bad cannabinoid and so we if we can separate out the good cannabinoids and essentially separate it out and allow good responsible pharmaceutical companies to mass market cannabinoids in terms of cbd then everyone's going to be better and so it's going to be great well that's the thing is people need to understand that the reason why we are in the predicament we are in is because for generations we've been living off of boxed food and we've all been eating genetically modified organisms. And so we are completely getting farther and farther away from nature. What is brilliant, and this is my personal thesis, I believe every plant on the planet has cannabinoids. It just so happens that cannabis is the most abundant. So when you take an essential oil of this plant, it's like jump-starting your endocannabinoid system and getting back in touch with Earth, and your body recognizes these natural ingredients and says, oh, this is how we're supposed to work. All these receptors fire for the first time. It actually can bind and restore nerve endings. It binds to the nerve endings, protecting them, and healing them, restoring them. Um, I So I have gone into the doctor, and um, I went into the doctor while I was in Boulder. I found out that um, my husband had been, you know, cheating on me, and I said, okay, I need a full workup. And I go in there, and he gives me the full workup, and I said, you know, by the way, for the last few months, my right ovary has been hurting, but it's only been hurting like three or four days out of the month. And he looked at me and he said, that's, that's pretty crazy, Shauna, because I know you had a complete hysterectomy and you don't have any ovaries. And I said, yeah, I know, but let's check. So he checked and there is a growth there and it's a nice little bouncy ball there. And um, it's possible that I could have, uh, as of it, Two years ago, I could have had uh, my ovary 25% regrown. Can't call it an ovary yet because it's not producing hormones, but... Um, but there's something going it, on there. It's totally something going on. And, you know, I'm, I'm ecstatic about the fact that my body can actually pr- reproduce uh, new organs, which would be great. It's just that this is not the one that I would have chose to start out with. <laughs> that was the one that was if you, the if you one got to pick. organ I was so happy to get rid of. <laughs> you said, I'm going to choose. So um, you, you said you, you're working with people who come to you. Uh, first of all, what are you seeing in terms of people who have um, advanced cancer? Have you worked with anyone who has uh, either cancer or advanced cancer who is looking for um, this as a treatment? And what are you seeing in terms of the results? 
So what I've been seeing is a lot of people come uh, and seek out the oil when every last other resort they could think of has been dealt with. So by the time they they look into the oil, a lot of times they've already had the chemo, they've already had the radiation, or they're currently on chemo and radiation. But what people don't understand is the chemo and radiation actually destroys so many cells within the body that it takes that cannabis oil that much harder to work. Um, but it's still possible. So if you've had chemo or radiation, when you're starting this, this method out, you want to make sure you're supplementing yourself with a high antioxidant tea, like a green tea, and steep it, steep like 10 bags of it twice a day. And that will, the antioxidants within that will help coincide with the oil on the healing. Using different herbs while you're on the oil will help to guide where you want something healed within your body. So if, if one herb uh, works on your kidneys and you're having kidney problems, you can take uh, you know, you can take like breakstone to, uh, you know, help out with your kidneys or cranberry juice to help out with your kidneys and the oil and it will just really intensify the effect of it. Um, people still have wonderful results. Tumors go away pretty quickly. Um, I usually only will work with people for about three months. And, um, and of course I'm friends with them after that. They can absolutely still call me, but, uh, I'll work with people for about three months. I teach them all that I can. I make them promise that they heal themselves first before they try to, you know, help anyone else. And after three months, um, they've gone through their own trials and tribulations and, and done what they can. They know how to make their own medicine and then they can pay it forward. So is there, it's just is been, there a is there a stage at which you would say to people? I mean, it's CBD, THC, cannabinoids um, may not uh, work for you as well because your body's been through so much. Or, or do you think that if someone begins at any kind of at any phase, uh, they can begin rebuilding those cells and, and seeing uh, a strong reaction quickly? I believe that it can happen at any phase, but at the same time, you've got to understand, um, there is a woman I was working with in Boulder who decided to start the, the cannabis treatment along with her chemo and radiation at the same time. And I tried to explain to her, anything that you're trying to do with the cannabis oil, the chemo and radiation is going to reverse it. So it's just like you're canceling it out. And, you know, she's still alive, she's still kicking and doing good, but she's still on the oil and on the chemo and radiation. So you're and, saying it's, um, it's, counter, it's counterproductive to do both? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you really, when you decide to take this course of medication as your treatment, you really need to look into it, do the research, realizing you are taking your life into your own hands at that point and and make the decision to go on. But you also have to realize that uh, it took me until finding the oil that realizing that my doctors are just practitioners and they're practicing and they're just guessing and trying to give me whatever pharmaceutical they can think of that will help. So when I took my life into my own hands, at that time I was the same way. I had tried every other resort that I could think of and... Uh, and nothing worked as well as this cannabis oil did. Nothing. And, and, and I, and in terms I, every of, year I and get for better you, and better. And for you, you're getting better and better. Are, are people you're working with seeing results better and better? Yes. The longer you're on it, the, the more healing happens. And um, cancer patients actually tend to heal faster uh, a lot of the times than people with autoimmune disease. Um, and the longer that you've had a disease or an illness, the longer that you need to be on the oil. Uh, I had mine for seven and a half years, and it took me a full year to be on the oil three times a day for me to feel comfortable Great. enough to go down to a maintenance day. Shauna, we're coming up on a break here. Uh, one more segment with you. If you can stick around, we'll do that right after this break. Welcome back to the Ben Swan Radio Show. This segment brought to you by uh, SnoopWall.com. If you go to BenSwan.SnoopWall.com, there you can get 
uh, 20 to 50 percent off an order. Essentially, Snoopwall is the port authority for your smartphone, specifically for your Android device. So they are working on the iPad and iPhone applications. Uh, essentially, Snoopwall is monitoring the apps on your device to make sure that you're not being spied on, either by government or by hackers uh, who are able to access your phone and also able to access your camera, your microphone, uh, both of them susceptible to hackers because so many apps will secretly or quietly access your device in those ways. All a hacker has to do is get into the app. Go to benswan.snoopwall.com. Check them out today. Shauna Banda is on with us uh, today. And Shauna, thank you for staying around for one more segment. Um, just as, as people are, are looking at your story, it, it's such an amazing story. But I think what's most amazing about it is you didn't go through a process of having some drug that was offered to you by a pharmaceutical company. You didn't have um, some big system built up around it. This is simply one woman through ingenuity, you know, being tipped off by the, the Rick Simpson video, but through ingenuity and by some luck, uh, you were able to discover your method for extracting the oil. And you said you still do that to this day. Isn't that where, where so many great ideas and opportunities come from is someone who a little bit of luck a little bit of providence uh and, and certainly opportunity colliding together at the same moment yeah absolutely and it can go so far so i w i watched what rick went through where he went to the american medical association he was going to all of the proper forms that you would think that you would have to go to the cancer society um, politician, he and he got had door closed in his face the the entire time, and I I watched that go down, and I thought, you know, the only way to do this and to do this right is to sell my book and then make a video and teach the world how to how to do the process for free. Well, and and that's what it really comes down to. Now, um, again, to be clear, so you are still. Uh, creating your oil, cannabinoid oil, um, in Kansas. Yes. Is it illegal for you to be doing that in Kansas? It is. It is absolutely illegal. But um, I will never go back to how I once was. I'll never go back to a couch. I will... Um, the pain that you have with Crohn's disease is just unbearable. People who live with chronic pain... They can't think straight. That's all they can think about is the pain that they have and how it can get better. So you can't really function in day-to-day -day life when you're constantly bombarded by this pain and not letting it go away. I will never go back to living like that. Um, and when you stop taking the oil, uh, you do regress. You need this. It is a supplement for your body to stay healthy. Your body has receptors for this. It makes no sense to keep this away from the people. And as far as I'm concerned, with the science out here proving that we have an endocannabinoid system that is the largest system of our bodies, keeping the only plant away from us that helps us is nothing short of genocide. It is the largest form of genocide we have ever seen on this planet. And it has been done through... Uh, secrecy. You know, the Vatican knows about this. Pope himself has taken the oil. Um, it has been kept under the rug and not allowed for the regular people. Man, if you can grow a plant in your yard for free and make an oil out of it to cure anything in your family, everyone should be demanding this. Everyone on the planet should be demanding this. And as, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to save my own life. And if other people out there are trying to just save their own lives, then nothing should impede them from it. Well, and that's Not the issue, thing. right? It absolutely is the issue because if, if this is your attempt, as you said, to save your own life, let's say it doesn't work at all, that it's absolutely just this hope and a prayer uh, that you have, right? You're hoping right. it works. But it doesn't, and the truth is you're just kidding yourself. Even if that were the case, and clearly in your case it is not, but even if that were the case, why shouldn't you have the right to grow the plant, extract the oil, and try it, and be wrong, and die? That That's exactly true, because when your life is in danger, it shouldn't matter. It's no different. 
I read this on uh, Facebook a few months back, and so I can't credit who who wrote this, but it's no different than hearing a, a child screaming in a burning house down the street. You go up to the house and you kick in the door to go get that child and save him. You don't expect to get breaking and entering charges after that. Right. Right. You would expect that you were attempting to rescue this child, uh, and therefore, and again, it, it's, it goes even beyond that, though, right? Because if if you as an individual run into a burning building, uh, are you going to be charged with a crime? And by the way, some people are. <laughs> some people get arrested attempting to do that kind of thing, where they're trying to go into a burning building. Well, you're not a firefighter, and so we're gonna, and you get end up getting detained or arrested. That's actually happened in some cases. But but you should have the right. And this is where it comes back to you know Colorado just passed this bill, this right to try bill. And my problem with the right to try bill, even though I think it's a good step in the right direction, it still requires that you work with a doctor and pharmaceutical companies. Well, where is my right to try anything? Right. Eating chicken bones, if that's what I want to do, and somebody tells me this will help you, and I, and I as a full-grown adult, choose for myself to do something, even if it doesn't work, even if it harms me, I should have the right to choose and in your case, what you're talking about is the right to be able to choose something that may or may not work. In your case, it is working. Why would anyone want to stop you from being able to do that? No, it's ridiculous. Only someone who's got power-hungry control, that's who it would be. But the thing is, is you've got to understand, this plant is the most non, one of the most non-toxic substances on the planet. More people die from drinking water than they do from cannabis. More people die from peanuts than they do from cannabis. There should be no reason why we shouldn't have that right to choose. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness includes me being able to raise my kids and go to events with them and take them to the park and be in the sun. I was on so many medications. I was taking 52 medications a day at one point. And for years, I couldn't even be out in the sun because not only did I have white skin to begin with, but all the pharmaceuticals they put me on made me susceptible to uh, sunlight. And I can be out in the sun all day now. And the, for some reason, the oil doesn't allow me to burn. I don't use sunblock. I don't use anything. But something within this oil doesn't even allow me to get a sunburn anymore. It's, yeah, it's it's, crazy. it's it's just it is crazy. It's it's so so remarkable. And again, uh, each person, each individual out there should have a right to decide. And maybe maybe it doesn't have all the properties for everyone else that it has for you. Maybe it does. Who knows? Uh, but we don't know until someone's allowed to try. And I think what's frustrating is you have all these people around the country who are literally being given death sentences from a variety of different cancers and, and diseases, and they're being told, you're going to die, and, and being told, go home and prepare yourself, but they're not being told, go home and try something else. And here's another opportunity, here's another way, here's another chance. In fact, the idea that someone who's dying of cancer would actually be arrested or go to jail for trying a plant is craziness. It but is it happens absolutely every day. crazy. It is ab and it's happening every single day, you are right. There's a great organization called the Human Solution who fights for cannabis patients who end up going to jail. And uh, they do a great job. I believe Joe Grumbine is uh, a part of that. And, you know, the thing is, I went to Colorado when this first I, I, started I gotta, to got to Got to cut you off there, unfortunately, uh, Shauna. Okay. We'll get you back on here again on the show soon. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. It's a wonderful opportunity to get this out here, and I really, tr truly appreciate it. Thank you, Shauna. All right, we'll be back after this. Welcome back to the Ben Swan Radio Show. Uh, Zach Bohannon, uh, you yourself, as a young man, had a, a pretty serious battle with cancer. I did. Thoughts on the interview with uh, Shauna Banda? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this occurred about 15, 16 years ago. I was in junior high at the time, diagnosed with a stage 4 cancer, which is the most advanced, aggressive stage of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I uh, was chilled, treated at um, here in Cincinnati, um, but did go for a second opinion, um, went over to Indy, 
uh, to the Riley Children's Hospital over there and discovered that they were using, um, I believe it was Marinol, and Shauna mentioned it. She did. Um, Literally, we were talking about this during yeah. the break. She came back and mentioned that specifically. Yes, exactly. Um, and so they were using that as one of the treatments. Now, I it's been so many years ago, I don't remember um, in what ways they were using it, if it was supplemented with... Um, um, chemotherapy. Traditional chemotherapy and radiation. Um, I underwent, under, ended up undergoing 14 months of chemo, but I, I don't know how they were using this Marinol. Um, if it was in lieu of that, I suspect it was not in lieu of it, and uh, I suspect it was just a supplement. Uh, maybe the pain factor. I don't know. Yeah, and she specifically mentioned as well mm. the uh, the fact that it's, it was a kind of a synthetic uh, THC yeah. as opposed to you know extracting actual cannabis oil yeah uh, it's in synthetic right so and at, and at that time that that would have been 97 98 uh, 1997 so at that point i would have guessed that those that those types of treatments would have been fairly experimental and on the ground level if if happening at if all if happening at all right. i was surprised that they were doing it in indy yeah um which would be a you know considered a more quote unquote conservative yeah yeah, uh, conservative place. It, it is. It is again. It, for me, it comes back to um, just an individual's right. I mean, why does an individual not have a right? And and you know, you talk about this struggle in junior high. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell you this as as a parent. I can't imagine what your parents were going through, um, watching their son go through this battle. And I can't imagine any parent if they know that this option is out there. This treatment specifically, you know, you're not talking about having a kid sitting there smoking a joint. You're talking about the extraction of oil, which we we use oil in everything we're eating, uh, and it's just a different kind of oil from a strain of cannabis, as opposed to from you know an olive tree, as opposed to from corn. This in this case is oil coming from cannabis, and if it can have that effect, I, I can't imagine any parent not wanting their child to have that opportunity and and to go through that healing process. Yeah, no, it's uh, and the the oil the, the oil part as we talked about does not um, get you high or produce a um, any sort of um, buzz. No, right? it's it's just there's no high associated yeah. with it. Yeah. And again, that's that's where um, there is this uh, I don't know kind of misnomer if you will because again with the way media is talking about it it's like well thc is the bad one that's the one that gives you a high um cbd is the good one there are dozens of different strains of cannabinoids within any cannabis plant and so when you extract those cannabinoids again you're not smoking it and you're not getting the high from it um yeah, so it's it's a totally different process. It's misrepresented, and and I think the thing that's most frustrating about it is when you know things like the fact that our government holds a patent on CBD for medicinal purposes. I mean, what? You're telling me that it's illegal for me to use it, and yet you have a patent on it? Come on, <laughs> that's odd. Yeah, well, we we uh, we we wish uh, we wish Shauna the very very best. Absolutely. And, um, and I I. Uh, I you know, I, I think that the um, now I thinking back to this Marinol thing. I think that it was used for um, nausea and pain hmm. associated with the the chemo treatments. That's how they were using it. I don't know how they're using it today, um, as far as that's concerned. But uh, we wish Shauna the very best. We're so glad that she's uh, she's doing better. I know Crohn's can be absolutely debilitating, mm -hmm. and it sounds like she had a pretty extreme um, a, a, a version of it. Um, but uh, but I'm. I, I chose to go the route of traditional, you know, medicine, and believed that uh, that that God uh, chose to heal uh, through that, uh, through the prayers of many, and uh, through through traditional uh, chemo. But uh, and we will pray for uh, Shauna's continued healing. So she's yeah. uh, she's doing well, and continue yes. to getting the word out about this this oil. And it'll be interesting to follow this in the in the coming days and weeks. It will be. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens, even over the next few years in this country. I think we're going to see a big push uh, toward you know, more individual freedom on these fronts. And it's only, again, because of the the ability for people to share information as we do through the Internet. Uh, what we have to remember about how vital and important a free Internet is, is it allows for the transmission of information like at no other time in human history. And if it weren't for things like 
Rick Simpson being able to create a video and put it on YouTube and then Shauna Banda seeing his video on YouTube and trying it out and going through her process and figuring it out and then putting a video out on YouTube herself about it, right? It's how people are communicating. That, that's never going to come out through traditional media sources. It, it's just not going to happen. And even now when somebody says, well, what? wait a minute, uh, CNN just did a report. C Dr. Sanjay Gupta doing his report on CBD is so many years behind all of this stuff, running literally so far behind. Now, that's not to take any shots at him, and I'm glad he did the reports because he has elevated the conversation by mainstreaming it. However, um, why now? And I'm suspicious of that to some extent because in his second report, the follow-up to, uh, I think it was called Weed 2, the first one was Weed, second one was Weed 2, um, in that report, he mentions about these big pharmaceutical companies that are now trying to create a patented version of CBD. Right, that they can now be given to people. And I've talked to some guys out in Colorado with a company out there who specialize in helping different individual uh, companies comply with the laws. And their biggest concern is that the regulatory climate, specifically for CBD, is about to become so difficult and have so many hoops to jump through and become so expensive that it essentially... Regulation is used to price everyone else out of com competing with big pharma who can afford to be able to comply uh, and eliminates all the competition for it. And I think there's a very, very real chance of that happening in the next few years, much more likely than it is just to see uh, – you know, the population turned over and say, everyone just go ahead and try your own thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to, that latter uh, option is going to happen. It doesn't happen. Um, yeah. It doesn't happen. And even if every single person out there were creating exactly the same thing that the pharmaceutical company is, is creating, exactly the same thing, would never happen. There's too much money. That's what the crony system that's what cronyism does, is it, is it restricts your right as an individual in order to enrich someone else. To me, cronyism is the single most perverse part of our constitutional republic because it is the opposite. It is the exact antithesis of what a constitutional republic is designed to do. The constitutional republic is designed to protect us from those who have power and influence from imposing their will upon us. Instead, it keeps the mob at a bay. That's what the Bill of Rights is designed to do. It keeps the mob at a distance. By the way, there's a video up. Uh, I want to just send you over there. BenSwan.com. Top story today. Video. Mike Lee wants to take on cronyism while skiing with lobbyists. And uh, we're pretty hard on Senator Lee here. Check out the video. But essentially what we do is we're, we're taking a look at the fact that Mike Lee has been coming out talking about that Republicans can become a populist party and a majority party again, he says, by taking on cronyism. And I think he's right. The only problem is Republicans don't want to take on cronyism. I'm not sure Mike Lee wants to take on cronyism. Now, we're kind of hard on him here because Mike Lee, who I have, you know, some respect for as a senator, uh, is also a guy who is part of this Lindsey Graham, Jason Chaffetz bill that says Sheldon Adelson uh, has a lobbyist who writes a bill, give it to us, we'll pass it and ban internet gambling. But if you own a casino or multiple casinos or have plans to build casinos, we have no problem with that. Really? So the, the guy who's worth $38 billion gets to write a bill, and you're going to stand behind it as a moral thing to do to try to block Internet gambling? Give me a break, Mike Lee. On top of that, CNN actually caught him uh, at, at the ski weekend that he held where a bunch of lobbyists were there, and he was confronted. And the, and, and the reporter, Drew Griffin, I want you to watch the video. We have the clip where he's confronted. Does a very respectful and actually uh, a very... Um, He's very kind, I think, in the way that he talks to the senator. And, and Mike Lee, when you look at his face, he knows he's wrong. He knows he's in the wrong. He's embarrassed. I understand this is the game that you have to play in Washington. I don't think you should be playing it. And I don't think you can stand up and say, we're going to take on cronyism while I'm also playing the game of cronyism. I'd rather hear from a guy like Justin Amash, who can't get money into his campaign and has to money bomb because all the money people say, we're not going to put up with this guy because he won't take money from us or he won't cut us deals that's the guy who needs to lead the charge against cronyism not somebody who's a part of it so mike lee i, I hope you're embarrassed by the video because i want you sir to become a champion 
of individuals rights and a champion for the people and not be beholden to any special interest. So I'll keep my fingers crossed for you, Mike Lee, because in that video, you do not seem comfortable. I want to keep you uncomfortable. Your calls after this. Gotta tell you, Zach Wohannon, the music is so much better when you're here. <laughs> what can I say? Thank you. Uh, on the days when I'm here alone, it's uh, kind of weak. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. My my musical tastes are varied, and uh, we try to we try to get a variety up here on the show. Right on, right on. All right, uh, coming into our final segment of the day, we'll take your calls. 800-313-9443. 800-313-9443. And this segment brought to you by AnthemVault.com. If you go to AnthemVault.com. Uh, there, you can use the promo code BIN and be signed up for free gold and silver. Listen, it's all about liquidity with these guys, which means, in essence, we're talking about the access to gold, buying it easily, selling it easily, stored in a vault in Salt Lake City. Uh, these guys are the future of gold. They have a great, great system. So if you're in the market for it, uh, check them out, anthemvault.com. Use that promo code BIN. Art is somewhere off the grid. Yeah. Ben, Josh, how you doing, guys? Um, I, I wish Chandra were still on because I would love to pick your brain a little bit. But let's be realistic about this. Um, and I'll answer your question why they don't want you to be able to try things. I'll answer yeah. that in a minute. But okay. we have to understand the government, as you pointed out, they have a patent on CBDs. They do. They know the benefits here. And what people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize, is there are tens of thousands of acres scattered all across this country which are controlled by the federal government where they grow pharmaceutical-grade marijuana cannabis. And now people will say, well, what are they doing with it? Well, they claim it's for research purposes, but we know that could be a bunch of poppycock because there really isn't a whole lot of research that needs to be done anymore. It's all basically been done. So while they may still be doing a little bit of research here and there, where's the rest of it going? Well, I'll tell you where it's going. And I know this to be fact, too. Part of it is sold on the streets. How do I know this? Because I used to buy it. I used to be a dealer back years ago. Where do you think I got it from? Duh! That's how I know the government is the biggest drug dealer in this country. The rest of it, what's not being put out on the streets, is going into stockpiles kept in areas climate-controlled, cool, dry, and in the dark. This is for long-term storage. Why? Because they know what's coming, and they want to have the best medicine that they can have so that they stay healthy. Now, the question, why do they not want you to be able to try something that may well save your life, was pretty simple. If you try something, and it does make you healthy, well, they don't make money off of healthy people. They want you sick, which is why they're constantly feeding you GMO food. They don't want GMO labeling. Why? Because they know GMO foods damage your immune system. They know. They, want, they also want you using these antibacterial hand sanitizers and these chemicals that kill off everything under the sun. Why? Because they know that if your body is not constantly hammered by natural bacteria, germs, and viruses, your immune system becomes weak because it's not accustomed to fighting these things off. And here's what scares a lot of people, why I love living alone and why I have very little contact with people on the outside world. I don't bathe regular. Why? Because I know that by only bathing a couple times out of the week, my body is being constantly hammered by viruses and bacteria, which is why I never get sick. I don't eat GMO foods. I don't drink fluoridated and chlorinated water. I drink out of a well, and the water actually has kind of a little yellowy tint to it. It's okay. I can filter that. Not a problem. So I'm not getting contaminated water. I'm not getting contaminated food, and I'm not germ-free. I have an immune system like you wouldn't believe. My doctor's amazed at how healthy I am. I'm over 50 years old, and I work. I can outwork almost anybody 25, 30 years old. Even you know though what's I'm interesting about that? Time, even though I'm in pain all the time, but how do I deal with my pain? I smoke a little bit in the evening. So let's talk about uh, the the early statement that you made about buying it from the government. Uh, can you define that? You said you used to used to sell marijuana, right? And you I used to buy be a dealer back in the eighties. Okay, so, so the, how would you how would you buy it from government? What does that mean? Uh, well, 
There are individuals, I don't know who they are now because I haven't done this since like the late 80s, early 90s, but there were individuals who worked through various law enforcement agencies like local police departments and stuff like this that they would filter. It, it's the same process the CIA uses for bringing heroin and stuff into the con country. They go through uh, gangs and such as this and provide them with the drugs, or in, in my case with the marijuana, and then I would sell it. Now, I got it at a hell of a price. Back then, I think I was paying like, uh, this was, like I said, back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was paying roughly about 175 per pound, uh, for a quarter pound, which wasn't a bad price back then. But I turned that into 500 bucks real quick. Cops left me alone. Why? <laughs> Who do you think I'm working for? I'm a distributor. That's what I did. That's how I know that this is going on. And if they right. try to tell me it's not going on today, they're lying. Well, and I they're think it's lying. interesting. You, you make the point, too, about, um, you know, the, the antibodies and all that. There, there's a number of studies out that show, you know, for parents, um, there's a whole movement to say, you know, don't freak out if your kid um, drops food on the floor and picks it up and eats it and, you know, allow them to be um, uh, some, uh, kind of exposed to far more bacteria. Growing up, we had we had five kids, and our first three, we were very careful with. My wife was like, you know, anal about every little thing and every little disease, and uh, one of our sons actually became very ill himself and still struggles with that. Um, and then after that, for our two younger uh, boys, she had heard about this and so went in the opposite direction and uh, tried to let them become much more exposed to bacteria. And it's interesting to see them in terms of their immune systems now, where my son, who is uh, the first one we did that with, has an incredibly strong immune system and rarely becomes sick. Uh, mm -hmm. his, his immune system is much, much stronger. So there's, there's definitely truth to the idea that... Um, you know, the more exposure to certain bacterias uh, that we have, the more healthy we become. Because, as you said, our immune system stronger as opposed to weaker because it doesn't know how to fight. Exactly, and, and you know, when my young, when my children, I don't, I don't like the word kids because I don't have livestock. I have offspring, which is why I use the word children. I'm I'm real picky about words, man. I'm I'm a, I'm hardcore about language. Um, but I studied law, so I understand how language works, which is why I'm really picky about the words I use. And when my children were growing up, you know, there wasn't all this, you know, freak out every time they got into a mud puddle or something like that. You know, they're children. Let them get dirty. It's good for them. It's healthy. So I, I, we encouraged our children, go out and play. We hear about a neighbor's child came down with smallpox. Hey, let's go visit, man. Let's get the young and let's get them infected. Let's get them sick. They'll get over it. Now they don't have to worry about it for the rest of their lives, and they can have an outbreak in the school. And guess what? <clears throat> My child is safe. Yep. Yep. Right on. Right on. Art, thanks so much for the call, man. Always good talking to you. All right, man. Have a great one. All right. You too. All right. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, some truth to some of that. And certainly, the uh, as I said, the idea that, look, at the end of the day, do pharmaceutical companies want you to be well? I think there are a lot of people who work in them who do. And there are a lot of people who work in them, who run them, who don't necessarily. I mean, there are a lot of stories of people who have created great products and those products are purchased and then shelved uh, because they compete. That doesn't mean that everyone up there is Dr. Evil, right? Who's sitting there like, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to kill daughter. them all. I, I don't. I don't think that's the case. But are there people? Are there individuals, uh, especially at the top of those companies, who are making an awful lot of money at the idea that you are sick and remain sick and, and have a need for their for their medicines and for their drugs? Absolutely. I, I think it's naive to think otherwise. I think it's naive to think that if pharmaceutical companies could eradicate all disease tomorrow, that they would do it, because they are for-profit businesses. They're not charities. Listen, and I don't even have a problem with that. Some people think that's like an immoral thing. I don't think that's a problem. But the problem comes in is when you put government between the individual and their ability to choose for themselves and say, well, the only acceptable form of treatment comes through these approved pills, these approved medicines. That's where the problem is. The problem isn't pharmaceutical companies. The problem is the FDA. The problem is the, the government agency that says we're the gateway to decide what you can and cannot take. The free market fixes the problem of Big Pharma.
when when somebody can just make the oil and stand on the street corner and sell it, guess what? He's going to put Big Pharma out of business doing that. So the free market actually fixes these problems as opposed to making them worse. That's what we need as a solution. Uh, not down with Big Pharma. It's up with the free market. And that little problem, it takes care of itself. Thanks for being with us today. Really glad that you were. Uh, we're back tomorrow, uh, 12 to 2. Actually, it, it'll be a rerun tomorrow. We'll be back Monday from 12 to 2. Uh, for Ben Swan, I'm Ben Swan. Zach Bohannon, thanks so much for being here. And uh, when I'm not on air, you can find me online at benswan.com. Of course, humanity is greater than politics.